Jason Cox. Hello, Dylan What's Buckley. Happening? How are we? Man, I have done a lot of podcasts. I reckon I've done over, I reckon nearly over 170 podcasts. Yep. Maybe even 175. First time I've ever had a guest bring their own laptop to an interview, to a chat. I love it. Is that weird? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what, well, I'm sort of the, I don't know what possibly is on there, but it's like, I like it. Um, I don't know what's possible on my laptop either, but <laughs> we won't go that far, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm doing really well, man. Doing man, really well. I've been so keen to, to get you on the pod for a while. We've been speaking for about half an hour before the show even started. But, um, yeah, super keen to have you in. Super keen to unpack today. Just chat to you, man. You're such an interesting dude. It's been, um, yeah, really excited to hear your story. Yeah, thanks, mate. It's um, something I've always wanted to do. Come on here. You're one of the uh, the OGs of podcasting. Oh. So, of, um, I know we ran into each other back near the Botanical Garden yes. years ago or months ago probably now. And um, was always keen to have a chat with you, man. I think you're an amazing person who tells some wow. amazing stories. So a lot. Um, always keen to come on and help out. How good. I remember still that day as well. You had a – it's weird when you just like remember these like little idiosyncrasies of like first meetings with people. But you had like – I was like, oh, yeah, let's exchange numbers. I'll message you. And you had this thing where you're like, no, just tap me or something. You're like, bump yeah. me, whatever. And you just like put your phone into mine. And all of a sudden <laughs> like this whole contact profile with like your whole name, number, photo – Every like email, Instagram account. So I've literally got all your details just in my phone now. You have my address. Yeah, I, I don't too, know. I don't know what I've got, but it was one of the weirdest things. I'd never seen this app before, and you just sort of like clink the phones together and it was done. Yeah, it's a buddy of mine um, actually started this company called Popple P O P L. Yeah, and um, they're getting bigger in the states. And essentially, it's your whole contact information in a little like button you can put on the back of your phone. And it uses NFC, so you just tap it, and then it just comes up with the contact details, and you yeah. save the whole thing on there. Rather than the awkwardness of like, hey, uh, you want my number? Like, yeah. It's a bit odd, like kind of weird. It's like, oh, here you go, tap. Do you know what? Most people are like, whoa, dude, holy smokes. Like, what is this, you know? So. The most awkward thing with that as well, and I'm not sure if this has ever happened to you, but you know when you sort of exchange numbers with someone and you sort of forget their name? Yes. And then you go like, oh. You give it you, to them. You, you just give go, them hey, the here you go. And then <laughs> they put it in and they put their name in because you're just like, oh, fucking hell, that could have been so awkward if you were like sitting there going like, what the fuck is this are you, guy's name? Are you one of those people that are like, let's say you meet someone, right, and then you forget the game name instantly. Do you have like the mates that stand next to you and they just introduce themselves to like yeah. remember their name again? No, nah, my, re- my best one that I always do is I actually will just say, we've got Handsome Darcy here and I forget his name, but I know you. I'll always go, oh, Mason. Um, I'll go, hey, mate, have you met Mason? Yeah. And then you go, Mason. And then he says, oh, Darcy. And then – Mason, get, this is – Yeah, exactly. Did you leave it blank? <laughs> no, you got, you got to go the other way. You go like, Mason, have you met – oh, no, sorry. You go, have you met Mason? And then – Bang, that's how yeah. you find out their names. It is very it's, – it's just kind of like dancing around the question oh, all shocking. the time, man. It's, it's, um, it's something I find weird about Australia is – I don't know if you've ever had this where someone's, I guess, like yelled your name. Because like you're very like, – I feel like a lot of people probably feel like they know you because of the podcast, right? Yep. And have you had someone that like kind of comes up to you and just kind of starts chatting to you and you kind of look at them and you go, do, do, do I know you? Yeah, I, honestly, <laughs> it's probably my biggest – my most favourite thing that happens because I, I take that as the biggest – compliment For that sure. you can build a kit like you know that we've had the podcast and people come to me sometimes and they'll say g'day and I'm sure you get this as well and you're so happy firstly but then they're talking to you like they know you and if they you know people would listen to so many shows they actually feel like they know you then I'm like fuck I'm going do I actually know this person mm. or have we not met before like it's so hard to understand like it actually tricks yourself you're like fuck I don't know if I've actually met this person before or not and you start asking these questions yeah. like how's, how's, how's family? work been yeah. what's family how's been family? up to you have you moved yeah. <laughs> um, what's happening with you at the moment um, just playing footy man yeah. just, um, I've is actually fun? got a is that fun um, footy can be fun at times yeah. it can be tough at other times but um, yeah at the moment it's just kind of I guess into the season grind in the moment and then um, I'm actually Starting on my own podcast, The Mason Cox Show. I love that. So I'm that. pretty excited about that. A little plug for myself. Name? But um, it took a lot of thinking. There was actually, man, it's kind of ridiculous. We spent probably like a week trying to figure out the name with just like tall tales, you know, and like all these different ideas. And we're like, yeah, stuff. Let's just go with The Mason Cox Show. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty excited about it, man. It's getting into a different sphere. Um, inspired by people like you to be able to create kind of your own content and being able to uh, to give your opinion and bring other people's stories into uh, into light, which is a pretty amazing thing. Just being able to share, I think, some amazing, positive kind of, I guess, grinding stories that some people you know have about their life of yeah. the, the ups and downs and all arounds. And um, I'm pretty excited, I guess, to uh, to be able to. Show people the amazing people I've met in Australia. I've been very fortunate with my circumstances to come here and be able to play AFL and um, meet a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds. And I think it's something I've just I've been I've wanted to share a lot of people's stories I've heard over the years, and um, whether it be you know people helping me or helping others. And 
It's just something I think I've had a massive passion for that I've, I'm probably well overdue to start. It's awesome, man. You know what I was actually thinking about when we were chatting about this and even just now again was like I love um, meeting people. I love hearing people's mm. stories and it's a reason I do the show as well. Like love just meeting, hearing how people have done things, how they've got to where they are, what they went through to do it. And I probably pride myself on relationships, like having relationships with people um, even, you know, not just in Melbourne but in Sydney and being able to go anywhere and, like, know someone and know how to do something, you've been able to do that in another country, which is actually, like, really incredible when you think about it. Like, you, you're not from here but you've come to another country and you've been able to build this network, you know, rightly you've played AFL and you've met, like, some cool people around you but how crazy. Imagine being a kid, like, back in Oklahoma thinking one day you're going to have a, a widest network as you do in Australia now. You wouldn't believe it, would you? No, nah, it makes no sense. I'm from Dallas, by the way. But yeah, I knew that. <laughs> Texas. Um, we don't do much research. Yeah, I'm no, sorry. You're all good, man. Yeah, but, um, Darcy. It is a weird thing. I look at it and like I said, I, I knew no one I knew no one in this country to go mm. play a sport I've never heard of and a place I've never been. And um, to see kind of, I guess, where my life has gone in the last eight years has been incredible. Like I couldn't have imagined it. Um, you know, the little things of I was a broke kid, you know, in college eating ramen noodles in a, mm. um, in a dorm room sharing it with someone else. It's like two, by, two meters by three meters. Like it was, you know, I was, I was broke. Like I was a kid that couldn't afford anything, you know. And now it's, um, uh, it's pretty amazing to have so many people, I think. And this is the Australian culture, reach out and say, I want to help you. I want to, you know, be part of your family that's away from family. And um, I've had so many people along the way that I've reached out in some tough times. And um, have kind of become, I guess, my inner circle and just have become my family in, in Australia, which has been a pretty amazing experience. It is amazing. Do you reckon, you know, we're jumping ahead a lot here, but is it is it home? Is it home for you? Do you think you'll stay in Australia? Like, do you know yet? Like, um, It is it is home, I think. Um, always on my keychain, I've got my keys and stuff I've got from my car and stuff and I always have my, my key to my house in Dallas. Yeah. And it's kind of a reminder of kind of where you've come from and like kind of... Um, no matter what happens, you'll always have your family back in the States. And um, that's something that's, I guess, always been... Uh, I guess a reminder of kind of the sacrifices people have given for you to get to where you're at, uh, whether it be brothers, you know, family, parents, whatever it might be. And um, I think that's something I think it is home. I would like to, to be able to have a, a career here post, you know, post AFL and be able to do some amazing things here. And um, it is at times tough whenever you're away from family and things happen or whether it be marriages and births and everything else where you know you're in the middle of the season, there's no chance of you going back. I was actually... Mm -hmm. Recently, supposed to, um, I'm a celebrant in the U.S. I'm a registered celebrant in the U.S. And I was supposed to be um, the celebrant for my two best friends' wedding. Oh, wow. And um, unfortunately, because of COVID, it was pushed back two years and they had to, to do it in March. And I was unable to go anymore. So it's things like that where you have this amazing once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that, unfortunately, because of your career, you have to miss. Um, it's times like those, I think, that are a bit frustrating. But on the other end of the spectrum, you know, I've got this amazing experience playing AFL and um, you're not going to be able to get everything and anything and everything you want from it. Um, there's going to be sacrifices you have to make along the way. Yeah, and you, you've done this bigger and on a bigger scale than anyone. But I think when you when you live somewhere else away from your loved ones, you always think you're missing out. You think you're missing out, but then you go home and nothing's changed. Yeah, exactly. So it's like you're not you know as much as you're missing out on things, you're always a part of it. You always got that there. Um, it's on a lot larger scale than I've ever done. But yeah, <laughs> kudos to you, my friend. It's been. Um, it's really, really is incredible what you've what you've been able to do. Let's unpack it. Let's go back to Dallas via Dallas, Oklahoma. Yeah, Texas, yeah. Okay. Via, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. There's one thing about yeah. Texas and Oklahoma. <laughs> Texas people are very proud of where they come yeah. from. So yeah. Um, yeah, I grew up well, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, man. And um, two brothers, two older brothers, Nolan yeah. and Austin, and then um, mom and dad, Jay and Phil. So I grew up in a very middle class neighborhood. Uh, nothing too too flashy, I guess, about it. And um, played soccer my whole life. So which is up. so weird, really, man. Like, you're so big. Yeah, I was a lot shorter back then in, like, 10th grade. Oh, yeah. Was, <laughs> yeah, but still, like, a quick, like relatively tall. Like, I'm sure you weren't, like, a piss ant, and then you've, like, grown into this, like, mammoth I was, human. I was tall my whole life, and then, like, ninth grade. I hit puberty real late. Yeah. So, like, ninth grade, 10th grade, uh, or you're 9 and 10. Like, I've got people that have photos next to me that are six foot tall that are the exact same height as me, and... And then three years later, I've got a photo and I'm a whole foot taller than them. So yeah, yeah okay. Um, I had this massive growth spurt. Uh, played soccer my whole life, you know, traveled around the world. We played in Europe and um, some of the best tournaments in, in the world and uh, was able to do quite, be quite successful over there and won one of them. We got third in another. And um, I think you get to a certain point, you get to about 17, 18 years old. And if you're not 
overseas, you're not going to really make a career yeah. out of it, you know, and you come to that realization pretty quickly. And um, so I got to that 17, 18 year old, um, I guess, part of my life. And I came to the realization that footy or sorry, soccer was not going to be my future. So I um, went to university, went to Oklahoma State University where my brother Nolan went also. And he was a walk on and played basketball at. Yep. Is that D1? Yeah, Division One. Yep. So the best way to describe it, it's tough to explain this, I guess, to Australians of what college is like. Yeah. Um, they see the movies, they see everything. Don't the get me cups. wrong. The red cups. The red solo cups. <laughs> yeah. I've sold a few of those in my days and I've drank a few beers out of those over the years. But um, part of my life was very much like that. It was a party every weekend. It was, um, I won't get into too much yeah. details, but <laughs> maybe post-career I'll tell some, uh, some yeah. of those stories. But um, yeah, I had like an amazing college life and um, I was studying mechanical engineering. It was, you know, sports was kind of out the window. I'd kind of, you know, given up on that kind of career and, um, never played basketball in my life. I never touched a basketball. Um, and this is a Division One. So back to, I guess, explaining college life on a Division One aspect. We had private jets flying us to games. Wow. Um, we had more money than the AFL does. The NCAA is a multi-billion dollar industry, a lot more than the AFL. And, um, yeah, like I said, we had private jets. We had buses. We had, you know, police escorts going to games and stuff like that. Like, it was a full ordeal. Yeah. And, um I, can't, I remember the first time I came to Collingwood, they were like, oh, man, how good are these And Collingwood being the biggest yeah, club. Yeah, yeah. they're <laughs> like pumping themselves up. I'm looking at them like, yeah, this is great, man. This is awesome. But in my mind, I was like, yeah, it's so much shit out wow. <laughs> like, yeah. So it's still, they're really nice facilities, but like you compare everything to the best of the best, you know, and you see some of these places like University of Texas where yeah. they have barber chairs and a barber that comes into the locker room just to give them haircuts. You know, you've got, everyone's got, you know, screens and uh, TVs in their lockers and everything else. And, there's, um, I guess, there's a big, big change or a big uh, difference between you know the college life, which is not even professional, like the college experience and then the AFL experience. And mm. there's so much money that gets pumped into it. It's it's tough to compare it to anything. Well, I, even um, when I was playing, we went over to uh, Northern Arizona, which was like a D3 college, I think. Mm. Use their facilities, and they were still probably on par with what we had back in Australia, which yeah. is crazy. Like their their school hadn't won a game. <laughs> like it was. It was unbelievable, the, the comparisons. I was like, Jesus Christ, this is crazy. Well, I'll tell you all the time. So you think about it, and there's, there's more people live by about 8 million people in the state of Texas than all of Australia, mm. one state out of 50. And there's about 13 times as many people in, live in the U.S. So you imagine taking the AFL's budget and then multiplying it times 13. Yeah. Like, you're going to have that much better facilities. But isn't it, isn't it unreal to see that now? Like, we think, and, and you'd have a better understanding of this than anyone. I know in college you can't get paid, but even with what – our best athletes are getting paid at the moment is so unders what would be in any other sport in the world. Oh, yeah. I find it like we have the – in Melbourne, I would say, per capita, the biggest supporter group of any sport in the world. Mm. Like, like the most engaged fans. Yeah, the most engaged yeah. fans. The most fans per, like, per city in the world. I don't think there's any other city in the world that's got eight or ten teams in Victoria, counting Geelong. Yep. Like I don't think there's any other place in the world that would have that many teams in that small vicinity. Yeah. Um, and that kind of plays into, I guess, how many people actually follow AFL and how, how kind of crazy it is here. And then you look at it and it's like a lot of the guys who are probably some of the top guys of, you know, your Tom Lynch's, your Dusty Martins and all them, like they wouldn't be able to walk the streets without people saying something mm. to them. But then they're not on, you know, multi-million dollar year, a year deals. Like we're not, you know, I think we're all still human at the time, yeah. you know, where I guess like in the States, like they would have a posse and a whole entourage of them, yeah. you know, and like they would never have to go to the local supermarket of Coles to go get their like local groceries and vegetables. Like that just wouldn't happen yeah. in the US. <laughs> like, but here we're all still like normal human beings. Yeah. All right. Back to, to college. <laughs> You're playing basketball, doing yeah. some slam dunks. So playing basketball, yeah, doing some <laughs> slam dunks. I think I did one, one or two dunks in my career. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I played so I played actually women's basketball before I played men's basketball. It's kind of a weird story, but my brother did the same thing. Is there was the um, so I like I said I never picked up a basketball in my yeah. life and um, went to university and on our floor we had probably like sixty people per our floor, um, all male dorm, and there's maybe twelve stories. So all those people, I guess you can imagine, they come out of high school and they go into the college system and they were probably playing sports in, in high school and then now they don't really have an outlet for that. So. People would just want to go play basketball. So, we'd like, you'd hear basketball, like, you know, dribbling down the hall, and then, like, 20 people would come out, and they'd be like, oh, mm. dude, let's go play 5v5. We've got, you know, two games ready to go. And that's how I got into it when you start playing every day at the local gym, just start playing every single day. I never played an organized game of, of basketball in my life. And got to know one of the um, managers for the, the women's team. They said, oh, would you come in and help us out? And I said, yeah, 100%. I said, what do you need? And they said, we need you to be Brittany Griner, which I'm not sure if you know Brittany Griner. She's actually quite relevant in the media at the moment mm. with things going on with Russia. But um, 
she was a girl that was about six foot eight and could dunk and was just a dominant force in the NCAA. And she just would absolutely dominate any team she went against. And it was just impossible to stop her. So they needed someone to essentially be as tall as her so they could mimic her in a game situation, right? So they're like, hey, will you come here? We've got five or six other people that kind of help us out and they run plays against the women's team. So then it's like, if they're playing Baylor on the day, Oklahoma State's playing Baylor, like we would run Baylor's plays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was kind of like that. So This um, is pretty much my whole AFL career, by the way. Like, yeah, well, Just pretending to be the small forward from the other team. <laughs> like a training. Give yourself some, some credit, yeah, man. No, no, oh, you made it an AFL list. Did. There's that's many people did. I've never got that far. <laughs> what I used to do at training all the time. Oh man, but yeah. So we so we just trained against them. We called ourselves a dream team. We would essentially go train on a Wednesday with them. We'd all have beers on the weekend. It was essentially we would get free pair of shoes and free clothes, and we we're like, this is phenomenal. Are you freaking kidding? We got clothes that fit. This is so good. So um, that was kind of all we got from it. And it was a cool experience. We got to go train in the in the gym and whatnot. And one day, the men's team was coming in. And they said who's that freakishly tall white fella out there? And um, they had a few guys drop out because of academic reasons or, um, you know, transfers or whatever it was. And they said, we need someone who's, a, you know, a big, a five spot. Um, would that guy be interested? And I remember I was in, like, biology or something. I got this random phone call and this voicemail, and I've still got it today somewhere. And um, he said, oh, come. This is a guy that says, oh, I'm, I'm Tommy Wade, um, part of the men's basketball program. Come to the, to the gym. We want to have a chat with you about the possibility of joining the team. And I was like, I always thought it was a prank call, to be honest. So I go over to the gym and um, talk to him. He goes, all right, cool. Um, we want you to be part of the team. We want you to fly all over the country. We want you to be, you know, essentially part of the actual um, Oklahoma State basketball team, men's basketball team for Division One. And I was a bit stunned. I couldn't believe it because it's like, you've never even seen me pick up a basketball, really. Like, you've never seen me play. And um, I don't think they realized I'd never played a game of basketball <laughs> in my life because they soon found out whenever I went down to the locker room they gave me a pair of basketball shoes and they had my name in the locker and all that kind of stuff. And they gave me a pair of ankle braces and I looked at them and I said, I've never put on ankle braces in my life. Mm, <laughs> I really? actually don't know how to put these on. So the trainer had to teach me how to put ankle braces on for basketball. And I went out there and I remember the first day I walked out and at that year I had a party house um, in college and all the basketball guys would come and party at my house on the weekend. And they kind of knew me as a bit of a, a drunk idiot on the weekend. And next thing you know, that guy shows up to practice <laughs> fully clothed, ready to train. And they're like, what are you doing, Mason? And the coach is like, oh, do you know Mason? He's like, how do you know Mason? He's like, I just really don't say. So, yeah, I started playing. I think the first game of basketball, organized basketball I ever played was against Texas Tech in a Division One game. Wow. I had no idea what I was doing. I remember I tried to check in. I was, as you go in basketball, you go in and check in. You're supposed to, I guess, kneel down next to the scoreboard or score yeah, table. And I was just standing there. I had no idea. And the guy's like yelling at me, like, sit the F down. Like, what are you doing? You know, and I'm looking around like, what do you mean? And he's like, sit down, fucking idiot. Like, and um, yeah, it's just like little things like that. They had a, a drill, a dunk on Mason drill um, that was literally just a two on one and just three alley oops to each other trying to dunk on me at, yeah. at one point. So <laughs> I wouldn't That's, say my basketball career was a uh, star studded basketball career. Do a lot of but, people like just that the know of you coming to AFL, they hear this basketball, they think that you were like a, like a NBA, superstar. Yeah. Man. I was like, I was a broke ass <laughs> athlete. Like, I had no idea what I was doing. And. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I just find it funny. Like I did towards the back end of my career, I was like, you know, this first person off the bench, they call it six man. But uh, for most of my career, man, I was a walk on who got zero respect and that is um, so good. was more known for probably my antics on the weekend for partying <laughs> rather than actually playing basketball. Unbelievable. So you're obviously an incredible athlete, which we know today. We've seen you out there on the MCG doing things. But how did the like how the hell did this whole AFL thing even come about? Like, what where was that? Because you've gone from soccer to playing a little bit of basketball just fortuitously, what was the first thing you ever heard about footy? Uh, first time I'd ever even come on my radar was we'd finished March Madness, which is like the very end of yep. the tournament at the end of the year. And um, Sorry, before I ask that, yeah. the players that you played with, yep. any of those guys go on to play NBA? Marcus Smart's probably the Marcus Smart. most well-known one. Yep. He's played for the Celtics. He's sixth man of the year recently. He's, um, he's known as one of the best lockdown defenders in the league. Yeah. Um, and he's had a super successful career. Uh, there's other guys that have played in the NBA but aren't in the NBA anymore. They're still playing overseas. Yeah. Um, so Markel Brown, LeBron Nash are a few, uh, Brian Williams are a few that have kind of played in the leagues over in Europe and stuff like that. So Marcus is probably the, the most successful, which oddly enough he went to my high school back in Dallas, like, yeah, and then wow. he went to Oklahoma State, and then now he's off in, uh, in Boston playing. So there are some people I've played against, like Joel Embiid, and I've yeah. played against him, Andrew Wiggins, like, I think my probably highlight of my basketball career is I shut down Joel Embiid for like a whole minute and a half. Yeah, we love that. Um, <laughs> get the fuck out of here. Uh, 
um, so that was probably the highlight, I'd say. And um, after that minute and a half, they yanked my ass right back off the court. Yeah, like, <laughs> Yo, go sit behind the bench where you deserve. At US sports have such awesome culture around, you know, people going to the games and supporting their teams and it's like that cult of following and you really invest it is the fact that if you're not going and playing somewhere else on the weekend, you've got nothing else to do. Like you yeah. want to be involved in a community, you want to be involved. Like whereas imagine how many people get to the MCG, you get 80,000 at a big game. Imagine if there was no local footy on the weekends and no VFL on the weekends. Imagine how many more people would be going to these games. It's true and it's it's a it's pretty amazing that 80,000 people show up to a stadium yeah. maybe once or twice a week. Mm. It's like I'll try to explain to people what AFL is back in the States and a lot of people go, oh, how's, how's, how's soccer going? Yeah. <laughs> like, soccer's going well. Yeah. Soccer's going really well. <laughs> it's going good. Um, anyway. And it's, it's tough to explain to them, I guess, you know, experiences like Anzac Day. Yeah. You know, 100,000 in the G, everyone quiet um, in a super respectful way of, of being able to honour, you know, veterans and, and people of military service. And it's it's indescribable. You have to experience it. And it's, if anyone's out there that hasn't been to an Anzac Day, I mean, I've been quite fortunate, I guess, in my sense that without even knowing really what it was, I kind of walked into it and was able to experience it multiple times. And it's something that, I mean, like I'm even getting goosebumps yeah, now thinking do. about yeah, it. It's do. like, it's yeah. it's crazy, man. And it's it's something that um, adds to the day. I don't want to say that the day's about that because it's, it's not about footy. Um, yeah. But it, I think it, what it does is the footy brings attention to what the day's about, yeah, if sure. that makes sense. Yeah. And things like that in Queen's birthday, to fill a stadium with 80 to 100,000 people and not be able to hear someone speaking next to you is insane. Like, you just can't really describe that. And it doesn't happen really anywhere else in the world. It's incredible. I won't jump in this time. Back to how you first heard about footy. Yes, sorry. We've, we've gone a few yeah, tangents no, here, Dill. Yeah. Um, first started footy. Uh, I'd never heard of it. Never knew what it was. There was a – we just finished March Madness um, and our media person had – emailed me or texted me and said hey i've got this weird email from this guy jonathan or, um jonathan giovanni and he you just have to come in you have to come into the office i don't really understand what it is and i said okay cool whatever so i go back up to the basketball offices and i clocked out by this point because i was done with basketball i was on my last year of uni like i was ready to graduate and basketball was done and he was like there's this thing um this email from this guy so we sat down looked at the email and he you know, i guess this is the australian football league or the afl and try to give a bit of a brief explanation of what it was and we're interested in bringing mason out um to a combine in los angeles and at that point like i said i had no idea what it was so what do you do whenever you have no idea what it was you google it you youtube it whatever it is so we went to youtube and the first thing that came up was probably the back of the flight of like jack or of, um of nick rewalt Rewald, nick yeah. rewalt going back of the flight and getting absolutely murdered and i was like these motherfuckers are insane. <laughs> I was like, what person in their right mind would ever do that? Yeah. And it was this like that and then like Jonathan Brown getting knocked out and then like everything was just like people and biggest hits. And I was like, I was a bit of a prick, let's say, in soccer and basketball. I was a bit physical and I was like, oh, I was kind of interested. And I was like, yeah, this looks pretty fun. Like essentially this is um, a game where there's no rules. There's a ball you have to kick <laughs> through some sticks and you can just belt the shit out of each other. <laughs> I was like, this sounds like a great time. Um, so I was interested and I was like, okay, well... I'll link up with him. And I think he had, we had gone through like Facebook messaging. This whole thing really kind of wow. started from like Facebook messaging. Yeah. <laughs> Ridiculous. And he's like, hey man, like we want to do this. We're doing this combine in the, um, the US combine in Los Angeles. You know, I've heard your story through different people like Holly Rowe and the March Madness. Would you be interested to come? And I was kind of like, oh, well, you know, I got nothing to lose. Like I, at that point, so I'd studied mechanical engineering um, and about six months before you graduate, usually you kind of go to a career fair and you find your job. I was fortunate enough that ExxonMobil had given me a, a job. So I'd already signed off to essentially say, I'm going to come and work for you guys. And so I kind of had that in the bank. I was like, well, worst case scenario, I'll just go back to what I was going to do anyway. Like, it doesn't matter. So I showed up and um, I said, oh, I was talking to him on Facebook and I said, oh, do you mind, um, is it all expenses paid? And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, all expenses paid trip to LA. And I'm going to say, no, it was a broke college kid, you know, yeah. like shit, man, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, right? So... I told him, I said, if I can stay an extra day to go see some friends there in LA, to go have a few drinks on the weekend, whatever, um, I'll do it. So, well, he goes, yeah, yeah, no stress. So I fly over to LA. I have no idea what I'm getting myself into. I've never actually seen an AFL ball. I've never you know, seen an AFL game. I don't know any player in the league. I've never heard of anything about this thing. None of us had a damn idea what we were doing, except for one person. There's one person there, and um, his name was Alex Arucchio, and, oh, um I played with him. Do you know him? Yeah. Yeah, you would have actually, the yeah. Blues. And, um, one of the most beautiful people in the world. Yeah. He was the only person that knew what AFL was. And he, and knowing him, you know, he's an yeah. amazing person who's very, very open and very giving. 
and he was teaching everyone how to play. And it was kind of an amazing, like, just funny as shit because we had Mick Albert and we had uh, a few other people, Shifter and a few other people there, and uh, Todd Canelli and all these guys um, essentially trying to teach these basketball guys who had never seen a footy how to kick and how to handball and doing little drills. And if you, if you would have been there, you would have pissed yourself because we were on a – essentially there was a adult league soccer game being played. There was a track around that, and the track was not – none of this was, like – sectioned off by any means mm. so we were sitting there like random people on this little patch of grass trying to play with these footballs we had no idea what we we're doing and there's like then we had like a 3k time trial and like as we're doing the 3k time trial there's like old ladies power walking next to us that we're having to like run around to try to like make our times and it was just it was kind of chaotic and crazy and i was like this is the weirdest combine i've ever seen in my life like i just don't understand how we weren't able to like book out an area you know and um Anyway, so there was heaps of people there, and there's probably two or three people that were kind of standouts, I guess, in that sense of their athletic ability. And I was the tallest guy there and ran a really good 3K time trial, and Collingwood was one of the clubs there along with um, four others, Collingwood, Port Adelaide, Richmond, North Melbourne, and um, Fremantle were all there. And I had no idea who these people were, didn't know what Collingwood was, didn't know what Richmond was, any of them. And um, Collingwood kind of, I guess, took a liking to me along with the other clubs, and Got to the end of the week and um, I remember sitting out this back of this like holiday inn in this like shitty cabana next to the pool and uh, they're like, oh, Collingwood wants to have a chat with you. So I went and chatted to uh, Derek Hines, who's a good friend of mine and was doing the recruiting at that time and I remember having this conversation with him. He goes, well, what are you doing tonight? And I said, you know, I'm like going to go have drinks with my friend and then like going to head back and then finish up uni and uh, graduate and probably work for Exxon Mobile. And he goes, no, 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 like we're going to book a ticket for you to go back to Australia tonight come with us we're leaving in like half an hour we'll book a ticket at the counter and you'll fly back to melbourne with us and spend two weeks to figure out what the fuck afl is and at that point i was like free trip to la now it's turning into a free trip to australia so i was like okay i was like um uh, thank you i was like i really appreciate it i was, I, was, I, was I didn't know what to say i was like man like i got no idea what i'm doing i got no idea what afl is i don't even like i've never heard of melbourne I'm like i know nothing about this this whole experience is ridiculous within itself and yeah, so then essentially we um, we all went to hang out with my friend and stuff. And I said, I appreciate the offer, but I'm going to hang out with my friend tonight. I'm going to go back. We've got two weeks of university left of this five-year degree I've worked on. Uh, I'm not going to give up on the last, you know, 100 meters of this race. And um, he said, yeah, no worries. We'll get in contact with you. And all the other teams were inv- interested, but I didn't realize this until later. I talked to, to people about it. And Derek Hahn being the um, the person he is, he's very good at what he does, a very good operator. And the other clubs wanted to talk to me, but Derek took up all my time before they could leave to go on the flight. Oh, right. <laughs> so no other team really talked to me, except for maybe like for half a second on that way out the door. So he spent all that time of AFL's time and all the other clubs' time to make sure he he was the one that got me. And <laughs> this is me going on a very long tangent deal, but um, it's a long story and there's plenty of other stories within it. But that was kind of, I guess, my first experience of – AFL. I love it. And, you're, um, you're already dominating the podcast world, mate. Long tangents is basically <laughs> the, the 101 of podcasting. So you've, you've nailed that. I do quickly, I know we, we jumped over, but Ella Riccio, who yeah. a good friend of, of yours and, and someone I got to know, I don't want to jump over it because one of the best people yeah. and a pleasure to know him, unfortunately passed away um, in Darwin. Um, but I, I think we talk about networking earlier and about like the people you meet and someone who throws himself into like life. That guy he lived, lived a life better than most people I know. Like he, well, anyone I know. He came here from the US. He was just this, his like aura around him was the most beautiful person you've ever met. He, I think, went to SA, to Gold Coast, to Victoria, to Darwin and just knew more people and impacted more people than a lot of people. So... Um, unfortunately, not with you, here with us today, but I know he's touched so many people um, in Australia and in the US. But what a, what a beautiful person! He's one of the people I think whenever I have shit days of footy, which yeah. can happen, you think about him and what he'd give yeah. to be in that position that you're in. Oh. And I don't know if you were in that game whenever we played at the MCG. I yeah, actually I got to play yeah. against him yeah. at the MCG, and I he did. was playing rock. I remember facing off against him, and I thought I was looking around. I thought, "Fuck, how cool is this? Yeah. Two Americans just I going played in that at game each actually. other." Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I just, yeah, he's he's always been an amazing person. I know it was a couple of weeks before he passed away. We had a, about an hour and a half chat of all the crazy shit he was up to in, in Darwin. And, um, yeah, it was it was tough, I think, during COVID to see um, him pass. But I was actually fortunate enough to go up and visit the Warsaw, mm. um 
and club and be able to I guess see some of the people that he had you know I guess um, been part of their lives up there which was yeah. pretty amazing South Adelaide uh, Southport, Southport Northern Blues um, Northern three Blues. clubs that he absolutely he was has. a big cuddly bear too oh, he was a huge geez. human I think he would eat like five to six chicken breasts a day like the yeah. guy was a menace, a menace. <laughs> and just his general aura of just like walking into a club and he'd walk into Carlton and sort of you know, walk up to Chris Judd and just have a conversation with yeah. him. And just feel, you know, just anyone and just like... Didn't give a damn who you were. Like, like everyone just human. loved him. Just a, oh, no. just a beautiful person. So, yeah, bloody incredible. I'm just blessed to have met someone like that, really. Yeah. Really, really beautiful He's guy. Changes your life and changes your he perspective does. on life. He does. very few people, I think, that do that Definitely. on a daily basis. You fly, you finish your degree and you finally come to Oz. What was your first sort of impressions of... Like you said it before, it wasn't as impressive, I suppose, as you thought, but you end up doing the deal? Like, how does that all go down? This could be a five-hour long yeah. podcast if you really want, Dill. Um, I legit, and Dill, this is, this is me being honest with you. I legit thought the AFL was like an Eastern European basketball league that would fold if someone's business went down yeah. and it was like going to be fucked. And I was like, I don't want to go all the way to Australia, play this weird game I don't, I've never even heard, don't know yeah. exists. And all of a sudden, some guy goes bankrupt and I'm stuck in fucking Australia and I got no idea how to get home. Yeah. Like, that's, that's what I thought this whole experience was going to be, if I'm being honest yeah. with you. <laughs> And um, before every team went and saw, we didn't know anyone, so we would study it and we go, okay, who's the president, who's the coach, and who's the captain? And if we can get those three names right, I think the rest will just kind of fill itself yeah. in. Um, so we, I remember the first place we went to was Collingwood, and we sat down and um, walked in, and um, there was about six or seven people in this in this meeting room, and they're going through this PowerPoint they had created and saying, like, you're going to be the next Nick Natanui, and all this. And I was like, eh, who the fuck's that? And <laughs> I had no idea, and then we kind of did this whole like experience of like seeing the whole place right and everything else and um there's something that happened to me i don't know if you've ever had this happen to you deal is it was a deja vu moment where i walked out and there's this there's a sprung floor inside collingwood facilities and i walked out and i felt like i'd been there before and i was like i've never didn't know anything about collingwood until mm. recently i like, didn't know anything about it and for some reason i felt like i'd been there and done this before in my life and it was this kind of like weird universe moment you know that feeling of just deja vu and um, stuck out in my head for some reason. I was like, okay, interesting. This place is obviously probably like, it's very professional. And there's a lot of different things in there. They're um, very, I guess, top of its class when it comes to, to AFL. And anyway, so we have this whole experience of meeting everyone. I left there and a little side story is we get in the, the car with AFL people to leave and there's a cab in front of us stuck at the corner of Swan and, um, and Batman, wherever it is. And on the back of this taxi is this you know advertisement. And the advertisement is, who wants to be a millionaire? And it's Eddie's face slapped on the back of the thing. And I go, shit, is that guy popular? Is yeah. he like the Regis Philman of <laughs> Australia? And he's like, oh, yeah, that guy's like one of the most well-known people in Australia. I was like, oh, shit, I would have never known. I had no idea because I'd never met Eddie, didn't know yeah. who he was. And then they're like, tell me about the – on the way back, they're like, oh, Nathan Buckley is one of the best you know, players to ever play. And I was like, I had no freaking idea. Like I just met all these people and was just like, yeah, it's great to meet you, you know, average human, whatever. And um, just met the whole crew and everything else. And for the next two, three, four different clubs we went to, all, all had that experience. And that first night after we went to Collingwood and stuff, that first night we stayed there, I remember being in so much shock of this whole experience of just like, this is ridiculous. We're half a world away from home in a place we've never been, doing a thing we'd never heard of. And there's all this media around it. And we're seeing our face on the TV and we're just like blown away. We're like calling our family back. Like, this is crazy. And I remember the first night we went to 7-Eleven and went and bought probably 30 Herald signs because my name and my face was on the back of it and we couldn't believe we were on the back of a newspaper yeah. just to bring home to the States because we thought this whole experience was ridiculous. What like, a whirlwind like entry into the country and even being able to, to fathom that at the time, not knowing one thing about it, being on the front page, back page of the paper. It seems, it seems nuts. What was – fast forwarding a bit now, what was yeah, yeah. some of your favourite – Memories playing footy, or fav- not, not favorite memories, most proudest moments, I suppose. Like there's there's some big games that you've you've played in, yeah. grand finals, um, demolishing the team you're just talking about at the MCG as well in that prelim. Yeah, um, talk us through a couple of your moments where you pinch yourself, going "fuck, did that actually happen?" Um, well, the first ones I probably come to mind are well, the first game, Anzac Day. Um, first kick, they first goal club. on Anzac Day, didn't you? Anzac Day, yeah. yeah. First yeah. kick, first goal club, same I'm as you. That. Yeah, yeah. Represent. That's um, actually not a very People think that's like an elusive club. I feel like it happens more than it doesn't, nearly. I like to think it's elusive, yeah. just so we could, <laughs> yeah. so we could be cooler. It um, happens a lot. It does. It, it maybe it does. I'm not really sure, but um, it is a cool thing. First kick, first goal, and then mm. you kind of get into a game right away, and you feel like you you belong, kind of thing. I think um, that first game was pretty amazing. Had 
mom and dad came out. They found out I was going to play before I did. Um, the club essentially told them so they could book flights over That's to awesome. make it in time. Um, and then my brother booked flights. Uh, both my brothers booked flights to come over here too. So both of them got to experience it too. So I think that was the first time I ever had my whole family here. Oh, wow. And I never thought that would happen. I really thought and at times, you know, you, you don't know where you're going to go and don't know where this whole experience is going to lead. And obviously in the first year, two years, it was quite tough to, to learn a whole sport from scratch. Um, and you do about two months of, of training, and then next thing you know, you're thrown in the deep end with guys that have been playing their whole life. They're at the top of you know the ability of anyone that's ever played mm-hmm. AFL, and you're thrown into it having no idea what the hell you're doing. And I, yeah, didn't really know, and I didn't know if I was going to be successful. Didn't know where the whole thing was going to go, and I thought, you know, if it's ever a possibility to play an AFL game, it'd be amazing just to have my whole family here at one point. And people talk about, oh man, the Anzac Day debut it was amazing, and. I'll talk about all these things. It's like whenever you play in those games, sometimes it's a bit of a blur. Um, but the one thing that stood out I mean, from that whole day was actually after the game, our whole family sat down, had dinner together, and me and some of my closest friends I met in Australia. And it was that moment I almost kind of like broke down because I was like, fuck, man, this is like something yeah. I never thought would happen. This is a really kind of like humbling moment to me. And it's something I look back on the day, and that's probably what I remember most, which is kind of weird, I guess, like with mm-hmm. all the stuff that happened on the day. Uh, that's definitely one. Um, Let's see, Queen's birthday was a big one. My brother was in town, both brothers in town for that too, which is pretty cool. Kicked five and was able to get the Neil Danaher trophy from him, which um, he's got the most amazing story of anyone yeah. I think I've ever met in Australia. And um, it was amazing to to be able to get a medal of his, or I guess it's a trophy given to me from him. It's something I'll always remember. Yeah, I'm just sitting there in, in my living room and um, something I value definitely. And then, yeah, you look back to that prelim with Richmond and then going into a grand final, but... A lot of people talk about that prelim. Yeah, um, and it was unbelievable. I I remember watching that. I don't it was know like why. Flow, I just, it, yeah. You were like in flow state. It was flow state for <laughs> sure. I was talking that much shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking all the trash in the world. Um, what are you just talking about that game now? I don't want to. It was actually unbelievable. <laughs> like, what do you remember from the day? And what do you remember like post it? Did, did you was there something different you went into it, or did it just all come together? So the week before we played GWS and yeah. I played an absolute shocker. Like I actually had a corky. I got in the warm up of all things. Yeah. Um, got a corky in the warm up and I could barely run. <laughs> and I remember thinking, fuck, if I get through this game, I'll be lucky. Yeah. And then I got to the Richmond game and before the Richmond game, I, um, I actually got an epidural in my back. Yep. Um, Cause my back was so bad. My hamstrings were so sore. I could barely kick a footy. And I remember getting an epidural and felt like a million bucks after it. And I was like, hell yeah, this is it. Like I'm, I'm ready to go. And, there's plenty of people talking trash in the media and everything else, Mick Malloy and whatnot. We'll um, we'll test to that, but um, yeah, I remember just getting to that game, just having a lot of um, doubt, I guess, towards myself and my career and stuff, and saying like, this is this could be a statement game if you want mm-hmm. it to be, and no one kind of gave you a chance, and you were the underdogs by far. And that week, I think we come in and some of the players, I guess, because I'm an AFL player, AFLPA representative, they came in, and I remember it was myself, Darcy Moore, and. Scott Pendlebury and these people came in for the memorabilia for the grand final. So if you win a grand final, you get like, you know, you sign off on, you know, signing memorabilia and everything else. And I remember them coming in a couple of days before the game, had the audacity to show what it would look like and put Richmond up as the winners of that 2018 grand final. Wow. And I remember just having the audacity to walk into the club and have photos of Richmond winning the 2018 grand final and saying right before we're about to play him. And I was like, fuck these dudes. Like, fuck these guys. Like, I'm filthy about it. And, yeah, just went into that game. And it was, yeah, it was one of those games, like, you just kind of, everything just piles onto each other. And you kind of feel like you just, in, like you said, in a flow state. And you just can't do anything wrong. And um, it's just kind of nuts. Like, I remember people talking about the USA chant and stuff in the, in the stands. And that was kind of kind of crazy. But I didn't really actually hear it. It's kind of mm-hmm. a weird thing. I didn't hear it that day. It was grand final was the first time I ever heard it. But, um, and the craziness of that day, um, obviously an amazing turning point in my career and one of those I'll look back on and always be proud of. But I've got a photo actually of uh, myself at the race. And after a lot of games, I'll go up to the race, onto the, to the edge of the field and just kind of sit there. And uh, there's something amazing and kind of spiritual about an empty M- MCG. Mm. And it was after this kind of chaos of this whole experience happening and standing there on the edge of this, of this footy field and looking into the stands of just like – holy shit, like, that just that just happened. Like, we're going to a grand final. Like, shit, I'm, I'm four years into knowing what the fuck this sport is, and I'm going to go play in a grand final. Like, this is insane. And I remember sitting there and just, like, no one else was with me. It was kind of this, like, spiritual moment with myself, and this person came, put their arm around my neck, and it was my mother. And she had walked up the race, and 
it was a, it was a pretty amazing like, kind of just experience to share that with her. Um, she's given up a lot for me to be where I'm at. And I'm very fortunate to have some amazing parents that have done a lot for me in my, in my lifetime. And to share that kind of, I guess, memory with her and sitting there after that kind of chaos. And she was just like, I'm so proud of you and all That's that kind awesome. of stuff, which makes me a bit emotional now. But um, yeah, it was a cool experience. I haven't really told that story. But um, yeah, I went to the grand final the next week and family stayed. So mom and dad were there for the, the prelim and the brothers came for the grand final. And um, that was kind of chaos. Uh, the brothers were on Media Street the whole week, and I remember like my phone was just blowing yeah. up for seven days straight. And Pendles told us, "He said, man, it's it's, it's unlike any other week. Don't try to treat it like it's a normal, normal week because it isn't. Uh, just enjoy the atmosphere, enjoy what it is, and and whenever the time comes to to have that siren go, just make sure you're ready. You're ready. You're, you're fully ready to go, and mentally ready and prepared. And um, I kind of look back and I look at my career and I think." Shit, man, I'm so lucky. I've I've experienced AFL almost to the max. Yeah. I've been in a grand final. I've been in the prelims. I've, you know, I've come from a country that knows nothing about this thing and be able to learn this thing from scratch and be able to experience almost everything that an AFL career can give you is phenomenal. Like I can't really be upset with it. Like it's a pretty amazing experience and something I'm I'm quite proud of. And I remember thinking about it. And I was like, even even grand final parades, man. Like those are before a game. Like most people don't experience a, a parade if they don't win it. You know. And I, I feel like I've done everything, but put a gold medal on my neck and say, you know, I've won a grand final. And at times I'm kind of okay with that. Like, yes, I would have loved to win it, don't get me wrong, but it's kind of ridiculous how much I've been able to experience my career already. So yeah. um, you kind of look back and just say, look, man, just be grateful for what's happened and, you know, keep working obviously to, to be able to hopefully have that experience one day, but also look back and be very proud of where you've come from. And yeah, I remember the grand final parade and everything else and that grand final was kind of crazy in a sense where – I didn't have the greatest start and actually had my first eye injury in, in that grand final. Uh, Tom Brass stuck his eye or finger in my eye and uh, detached my retina um, in my right eye and I didn't realize that until a year and a half later. But that was the first game I think I'd ever heard the USA chant. I thought that was really cool. I thought that was kind of – who would have come to an AFL game not knowing a damn thing about AFL and going, what the fuck are people chanting USA yeah. for? In an Australian rules football game that no one knows in the USA really, like it's pretty unknown in the U.S., and to have that was pretty cool. And I remember there was about three, maybe the third quarter, the fourth quarter, I'd kicked a goal. And I remember I sat there and I went like this because I was just, fuck, I was taking it in. Yeah. There was no other, never, this was never going to probably, this may never happen again in my life, you know. And I just remember doing this like, shit, yeah. Like this is the, one of the best feelings I'll have in my life. So good. And um, I just remember taking it in. It was just one of those experiences that was pretty amazing. And then obviously that experience went pretty shit pretty quick. So yeah. <laughs> West Coast came back and, Dom Sheed kicked a uh, – I got a front row seat. I was on the mark whenever he kicked the goal oh in the corner. God. So I was like, motherfucker. <laughs> amazing. Um, so it was an amazing kick, an amazing goal. And you got to give credit to the guy and under that circumstance and pressure to kick that on, on the corner. It was pretty phenomenal. And, um, yeah, it's you – know, like I said, it was pretty – I guess like you, your hopes and dreams of being able to, to yeah. win that grand final and knowing you may never get that experience again. And, and not winning it was, um, yeah, quite crushing after the game. But – um, you look back, you know, two, three, four years later that we are now, and um, you're just grateful you had that experience, I think, more than anything. Yeah, uh, you, you're exactly right. You're extremely grateful. You've done some incredible things, and, and your, your story of, of doing it is, is great that we've been through today. Has there been a time through your career where you haven't thought things were going to work out, where you have really struggled to, to see the light or see going, fuck, is this actually going to work out? Yeah, there's been plenty of times. I talk about the first year, and I remember – breaking down like multiple times just crying just because I was like man what am I doing mm. like I'm half a world away from friends and family I'm in yeah I'm trying to play AFL which I have no idea what I'm doing half the time I'm trying to learn how to kick and handball and everything else and I look like an absolute idiot in training like you know is this really what I want to do and this am I you know, am I essentially wasting my you know time in life trying something I know that's not going to work and I think those there's times like that and there's there's amazing people I've had in my life and it's kind of crazy how the world comes full circle it's um the person who I spent most time with uh, whenever I first came to the club was Craig McRae, who's now our head coach. Wow. Um, so I've got an incredible amount of respect for the man, and um, he's always been one of my closest, I guess, confidants in Australia. And um, still catch up with him for dinners and stuff and everything else, and um, he's one of my closest friends here, I think, and he's done so much for my career. It's cool to uh, just want to be able to give back to him and be able to help him out in his, you know, start of his career um, as a head coach. So very fortunate he's now the head coach of the football club, and um, – 
yeah, I'll look back to those early days where he's about half a he's about half a size, man. Yeah. You know, he's a little fella, and uh, he always says, "Don't forget the little people along the way." Is always kind of the thing he always used to tell me. And um, yeah, so his first year, I think that was probably one of the hardest of you're learning a new sport and like the learning curve is so steep. Like, and then once you get past that first kind of hump of like, is this really like I need to actually properly dive into this thing and spend you know twelve hours a day, you know, just being fully invested in this thing, and that was quite a steep learning curve. And then once you start seeing things kind of click and you start realizing like, oh, shit, I can actually do this playing mm. your first game and getting over some of the stupid, I guess, um, things you would do without knowing. I remember one time I ran like 60 meters and didn't bounce the ball and I had no idea. And the whole team just started pissing themselves laughing. And I was like, I didn't know. Like, I had no idea. Like, I had no idea to bounce the ball. So there's little things like that you kind of laugh about. But uh, that was probably one of the times first year. And then as of recent, I think with COVID and everything else, is it's tough to – to sit there and this whole experience is one of the reasons I came over here to play FL was to get this experience of living away from home and having these amazing experiences. I love to travel, and I love to see new things, and you'll you'll be hard pressed to find me sitting at home on a weekend. And um, I think going into a hub and not being able to leave your essentially room at times and, and all that probably took a bit of a mental toll on me for a while. But um, you've come out the other end of it now. It's so good to have freedom again. Mm. So good to see people and be able to have conversations. Um, and I'm sure. You would feel the same. I mean, this is your job to have conversations. Yeah. You know, it's um, it's an amazing experience you get to actually have as, as a career. And yeah, I think those two years, three years that we spent through, I guess, COVID were quite tough for myself and mentally being away from friends and family. And you kind of wonder, is this, you know, is this the end? Is this kind of what I want to do for another chunk of my life? And um, over the last kind of probably year, it got to the end of last year, and <coughs> excuse me, um, end of last year, the club wasn't sure if they're going to keep me. They were like, you know, if you want to go see other options, feel free. Uh, it's kind of weird for a club to say that, yeah. you know, you're like, I've given seven, my, seven years of my life to you and you kind of know it's maybe a possibility, but I think you would have been the same. Whenever mm-hmm. someone actually says it, it's kind of like, oh shit, I'm like this must be, this might be it. Um, and it was fortunate enough, things have kind of, kind of worked out and I got another year at the club and uh, I'm still at the pause now. And um, yeah, there's, there's little moments like that. I think you realize, you know, you kind of look back to the whole career and you kind of realize how fortunate you are and you, you realize um, it's going to take a lot of work to keep going and you got to maybe take a different role as more of a leadership role or more of a um, guiding young kids through the system kind of role than maybe in previous years before. Have, have, how have you found that being in Australia, like the differences between Australia and the US in terms of culture, in terms of that sort of side of things, with even like the public, uh, sorry, like the news related things or fan engagement, like have you found there's been tough times in your career where you do feel like people have been piling on you because of this, um, the character you are that is different to anyone else in the game. And, and we love it. We need it. Like we want that attitude. I love when you are saying before about when you played that game against Tigers and you're walking around and you're in that flow state and you're fucking dominating and you're yeah. showing it. But there's a lot of people that wouldn't have liked that and that don't like that in, in the game now. Like have you struggled to – does it bother you? Does it bother you that some people would, would have that opinion? Not really. I think uh, we talked about this before the podcast. You had Kane Corns on here recently. Yeah. He talked about people that troll him on social media, whatever it is. And he looks at him as someone who's probably a 40 year old living in mom's space and that's got nothing yeah. else better to do, you know? And that's that's legit. I, I listened to that and I was like, I, I say the same thing. Yeah. Like, I have that same mentality. So and I'm good. like, yeah. you know what? Stuff it. Like, you're probably pissed off that some guy doesn't even know what the. F- F- AFL is just walked into this and was able to be somewhat successful yeah, like, yeah. if you can hate on me for that it's like man you just didn't have the audacity and the the grind and the mental like you know toughness to be able to want to actually make a career out of it so, good. Did. so if you are pissed off at me because I've been able to accomplish something you weren't able to accomplish then stuff you man I don't give a shit I love that it's like I don't know man I, I've, I've dedicated my life to this thing you know I, I can't say that like you know there's kids that are out there that have played footy you know before they're even 18 they've played longer than I have you know, like from Oz kick up, there's a lot of kids that are still in probably Oz kick that have played footy longer than I have, you know, and um, I'm proud of where I've come from and how hard I've had to work to get to where I'm at. And um, if someone wants to sit there and troll me on Twitter, or tr- troll me on social media, or people in the media talk trash about me, it's like you're just looking for a headline and something mm. to talk about, to be honest. Um, and you just have to have that mentality, I think, of, you know, I think my whole story in general is going to be hopefully a legacy I'll leave behind that someone else can pick up and maybe build upon at some point in my, my life. I'd love to see someone else from the U.S. come over here and, and play more games than I have and kick as many goals as I have for more and be able to play more uh, important games and everything else. And, you know, that would be awesome for me. I'd love that. And I'm proud of where I've, what I've been able to accomplish and where I'm going. And I know that's going to upset some people because they like to have the old school mentality to it. But 
Stuff them. Mate, nice. it's awesome. It's such a it's such a good answer. I'm so happy that that's the way you feel. And I know it I knew it was the way that you'd feel about things, but I think that's what I love about you the most is is that mindset and that way to, to view things. And I think whatever you're doing, you just gotta keep doing it. Because mm. it's it's making impacts. And I think you're exactly right. If you don't have haters, you're probably not making a big enough impact on the game as it is. Do you ever get haters? Not really. That maybe that's maybe that's <laughs> the reason why. Maybe that's okay. the reason I'm not making any impacts at all. <laughs> yeah, you're making plenty of an impact. No, to okay, be honest, too. I've actually I had a conversation about this a while ago. It's a bit different with with podcasting now. AFL, you're on TV, right? So you're yeah. like people are seeing you. And if they you, you're attracting people that might not want to view your content. Whereas my content, it's like you have to go out of your way to find it. Yeah, okay. I'm not in people's probably faces as much as what you would be being on Friday night footy or Saturday night footy. So it's sort of like. At the end of the day, if you don't want to see me, you don't have to. Yeah. Um, which has been a benefit of of that because there's definitely haters out there. And fuck, I, I went through the other day on my Insta- – I, I just have a zero policy, uh, policy on on like social media and like people commenting stuff. If someone comments stuff that I don't like, bang, block straight away. Okay, like yeah. just blocked yeah. straight away. Even if it's just like somewhat – just somewhat there, I'm like, no, nah, I can't be fucked with that. Like it's just yeah. not what I'm interested in. So I just like straight away it's done. Well, you'd be – pretty damn proud of this podcast would you i am i'm proud of the podcast should be. yeah no i am but it's it's that's why when you say that about what you sort of that mindset that you've like had with everything with like cane corns and stuff i still think like if i'm honest it, i'm probably not at that level yet where i can be as strong as that so i just don't like mm. to view it like I, I see you a lot like you can you, you even engage with people sometimes which is awesome but i'm just like no fuck that i can't do it because i know it does have an impact on me yeah okay. like it's hard to it's hard to just let it go yeah, I'm more of like a set it and forget it. Yeah, like yeah, I put yeah. it out there and I'm like, and delete Twitter from my phone. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, I just block it. Yeah, just okay. block. Yeah, yeah. I don't like it. Well, I think, um, I think you, like you said with the podcast, I think like your, your podcast is very much telling the positive stories and the amazing yeah. experiences of of others, and it's a credit to you, man. Like you've been able to build Dylan friends to what it is, and. Um, I'm sure it would have been times when we first started. I, mean, I listened to your first podcast the other day oh, and you are talking about the dating life of Josh. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you've come a long way, man. You should be oh, proud of it. Like nah, you've you've you. done some amazing stuff and you probably have transitioned from footy to the media industry better than anyone else of our wow. generation. I'd that say. means a lot, man. And I'm looking forward to chatting about that on your podcast. Mason Cox Show. Mason we'll have Cox it soon. Show. We'll get on it. <laughs> um, before we wrap up, man, I want to talk about just in the modern day, um, Mason Cox at the moment. Your eye. Mm. Talk us through. Yes. You, you mentioned it earlier. Um, first injuries in the grand final. Um, obviously, at the moment, wearing the glasses to protect the eye. How serious is this, and what actually happened to, to start the injury? Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. It's um, oh, geez, man. The first, like I said, the first, I guess, injury happened in the grand final, and I didn't know it actually happened. So it wasn't until I actually had the injury on the other eye. So my right eye was poked in the grand final, and then um, about a year later, or sorry, about. Oh, maybe seven or eight months later, mm. I was playing against Gold Coast in the Rock, and um, well, the other Rockman came down. I won't say his name because I've yet to play against him since. But um, came down and he accidentally got his finger in my eye and actually ripped off half my retina. And um, what happened was I was kind of like, you know, you get poked in the eye, you kind of see the stars and stuff. It's like, honestly one of the most underrated pains in the world getting poked in the well, eye. It wasn't really painful. Was a weird thing. Oh. It was just like I couldn't see. And you know, like usually in like five minutes, you know, your vision comes back, you're fine. Yeah. I played out the rest of the half and I came into the locker and I started seeing these dots everywhere. I said, this is very different from any other eye poke I've ever had. And I went to the doctor and I said, hey, just flag this. Just let you know something seems a bit off with my vision. I can't really see too well. And he goes, oh, I'll bring you in. So he looks at me and he actually, I've got a photo and it's the pupil is actually like off-centered. And um, he kind of looked at me and whenever a doctor looks at you and kind of gets a bit of a worried face mm. and starts not really knowing what to do next, I guess, at times and um, goes a bit kind of quiet, you kind of know you're in, you're pretty serious. And um, he goes, no, nah, you're going straight to hospital. And I was, I was not in pain. So I was kind of like, what do you mean? Like, I'm fine. I'll go play out the rest of the game. We'll be good. Whatever. Like, I'll, I'll sort it. We'll sort it after the game. Whatever. He goes, no, nah, you need to go to the hospital right away. So we um, waited for an ambulance. The ambulance took forever. So we just took a car over to um, the Eye and Ear Hospital. And um, oh, it was a Sunday, so they didn't have the private hospital open. So oh, I sat God. there in full game kit, essentially, in the waiting room. <laughs> like like to get boots, and, like yeah, everything. Like, I had the boots off, but yeah. like, <laughs> I essentially had full Collingwood kit on. I was just sitting there like, oh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> like, what is this? And I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't in any pain. So I was yeah. kind of like, oh, this, this will be fine. This will be fine. And... 
I went in and got checked out and the doc came back and he goes, I've got some bad news to tell you. And I said, yeah, yeah what is it? And he goes, you've detached um, half your retina and your left eye. And um, the, the doctor thought originally that I had uh, dislocated my lens. Uh, but what happened was actually essentially he got his fingernail in there and detached the retina from the actual eye. So oh um, it's pretty, pretty grim and gross. And I kind of was just like, oh, this is so weird. Like, I, I just don't understand it. Like, I can, everything's blurry. It's all my dots over or whatever. And he goes, I've got some more info I need to tell you. And I said, what is that? And he goes, well, your other eye, your good eye, the one that wasn't poked, has actually got a detached retina also that's been there for a while. And I said, what do you mean? He's like, you've essentially come in for one eye and you've come out with two bum eyes. So was that the one previously? So that was from the grand final, yeah. So I had no idea and I was just playing with it. And I was like, whatever. It just kind of seemed like I had a bit of a lot. You know, you get tired and you kind of lose a bit of vision. You're kind of like, oh, I'm exhausted. Well, I guess that was the reasoning. I couldn't see as well. So essentially... You know, the next day with the surgeon, uh, talked to him about what we we're going to do, and he essentially said, yeah, we're going to have to reattach your eye, put a heavy liquid in there, and then uh, that'll be the first surgery, and then cryotherapy on the right eye will be the second surgery, and then we'll have to do another surgery to take the heavy liquid out. Um, and it went through this whole kind of process of different surgery that I would have to have. And, yeah, we got after the first one was probably the most serious one where he actually had to, like, essentially sew my eye back together. Um, in my left eye and, and five years ten years ago you'd just lose it you just wouldn't have an eye and you'd yeah. be one-eyed um, and I'd be a one-eyed calling with supporter so um, <laughs> that's a joke um, so yeah so essentially I went in and he sewed it up and I sat there and he goes for the next <laughs> so he goes for the next two weeks for 45 minutes of every hour you're going to have to be positioned on your back and you can't move fuck for two weeks straight so, sorry, say that again. For 45, 45 minutes of every hour, you'd have to be on your back and you couldn't move. So you could get up, you could go to the toilet. So for 45 back minutes of each back. hour, all, all day. All day. I'd have to be on my back staring at the ceiling. With eyes closed or open? Uh, I or couldn't open. see. Yeah. So it didn't oh, matter. Yeah. I was blind. Well, I couldn't, there's no, there's no vision. I couldn't see. So essentially we had, I had probably five or six different bottles that I had to do, you know, eye drops in and stuff. And because I couldn't actually read anything, you I could just see. You could, you could go crazy. Yeah, yeah, well, I think the biggest thing that plays in your mind is, am I ever going to be able to see again? Yeah. That's probably the biggest thing that was going through my head yeah, of like, is this actually honest, going to become yeah. better? Is this vision going to come back or is this how it's going to be Was this both forever? eyes or one at the so time? So the first one I had two surgeries in one, essentially. I had the left eye got sewn all the way up and the right one had cryotherapy on yeah. it. So yeah. I couldn't really see either either. And I I was sitting there, I'd just broken up my missus at that time. Um, and I was in a one bedroom apartment living on my own. And I remember sitting there in the darkness and not even being able to read my phone for the people that were calling me or texting me. I had no inclination of what was going on. I just had to sit there and stare at the ceiling. And um, I would ask Siri to play podcasts, you know, and I remember playing, you know, this this one about the, you know, the first people going to the moon and all these kind of things just to pass the time. And um, yeah, for 45 minutes every hour, for two weeks straight, I'd sit on my back in a dark room, essentially blind, couldn't see. And I was, my vision was so bad that I can only kind of make out maybe like a color of, you know, like this would be silver or that would be like brown. And um, I had these droplets and I essentially had to get a friend to come over and just put a highlighter to it and just make it bright pink. So I knew the bright pink one I've got to take three times a day for, you know, however many times, blah, blah, blah. And then the bright blue one would be two times a day and then the, the white one would be five times a day, whatever it was. And sat there in a dark room for about two weeks with my thoughts and thought, you know, is my AFL career over? Am I ever going to play again? What's going to happen? Am I ever going to see again? And um, I remember out of that whole thing, I kind of didn't really tell too many people, I guess, how serious it was. But we mentioned this guy early in the podcast and – there's one person that's always kind of looked after me and has always kind of been a bit of a, somewhat of a father figure for me in Australia. And um, he was the only person, I guess, from the club that messaged me after the surgery. And it was Eddie McGuire. And I thought of all people in the world, the guy who's probably the most, the busy out of everyone, he was president at the time, uh, for him to go out of his way to say, mate, if you need anything, let me know. I'll Uber eat stuff to you. I'll get, you know, I'll get the boys to come drop something off. Whatever it is, anything you need, just let me know because I know you're away from family. So... It's little things like that that, you know, whenever people actually give a damn about you, whenever you're in some of your tough times and some of the hardest times in your life. And um, he reached out with something I'll never forget and I always have a soft spot for him. And we always do dinners and every Christmas together. He's always looked after me since I'm away from family. So I've always had um, a, a very, very soft spot for him and he's always kind of looked after me. But so essentially I go through the, that two weeks. Um, so whenever we had COVID and I was like two weeks in a hotel room is actually not too bad yeah. comparatively. So... I did that, and then um, 
essentially from there he took the liquid out of my left eye um, and put a, a gas in there and the gas bubble eventually kind of seeped out and you got back to that so um yeah and then i eventually over time just started to get my vision back and be able to see a bit better and everything else my season was done i knew i was i was done i remember we were in i think like a you know quarterfinal or something we we're playing geelong and i couldn't even tell who was on what team i couldn't i couldn't see i couldn't see who was on the field and who was wearing what stripes and I had no idea. I had to ask people, you know, did Jesus we kick that goal? Christ. Did you know how did we go? Or I just essentially based it on other people's reactions. And um, yeah, and then the next year is essentially is COVID, and you can imagine going through the rehab of this, not really being able to have proper surgery. Like you know, after the surgery, I couldn't actually check in with my doctor because we weren't allowed to go see doctors. And we got shipped off to Perth, um, shipped all over the you know, all over Australia. And I remember being in Perth and being totally locked down, but having this issue of not being able to see properly through my eyes and my vision essentially was totally changed. So now I've got a bit of a correction in my eyes and my left pupil doesn't, um, doesn't constrict anymore. Um, so you can probably, uh, at times you can see is whereas my left pupil is a lot bigger on my right. So if it's sunny out, then essentially my left pupil doesn't constrict the amount of light that comes into your eye. Therefore it feels like you're looking into the sun. Yeah, so right. whenever I play people say, Oh, why are you wearing sunglasses? And it's because it actually dissipates the amount of light that comes into my eye. So that's the reason there's a tint to it, uh, which is kind of crazy, the whole thing. And then obviously, um, if I get a finger in the eye again, I'll go blind, no doubt. So they're not only one for vision, but also two for protection. Um, so it's a unique look. It's definitely a unique look in the AFL, but um, it's it's purely, I guess, a medical thing now. But so. isn't, it, isn't it crazy like to hear that story now, like fucking hell, I think anyone would be like, I'd wear glasses 100%. But the way mm. it perceived in the media, it was just like, Mason Cox just wants to wear sunnies. Like I felt like that was like the message <laughs> that was Mason going Cox through. Wearing speed dealers. Yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was. I didn't really appreciate the way it was taken. I guess. Yeah. Um, I think it was pretty well known. I guess what had happened, and I've told the story a few times. And as a as a media personality, who's going to comment on those things, I find it that it's their duty to know the background of it yeah. and make comments on it. And I think there's quite ignorant, um, I guess, conversation around it. Um, I will say, but. It's just part of the media, man. Like, I mean, I wouldn't say we in Australia have the most qualified media department in the world. Okay. Um, there are some amazing people out there, don't get me wrong, but I think, um, I won't go too into it, but I think there's definitely some people in room for improvement, as, as there always is. Um, but with the, yeah, with the Sunnies and everything else, man, it was um, it was a long road to recovery, and I didn't it's know serious. kind of it's where really things serious. were happening yeah. in. And um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to still play footy, and it's, it's been a grind at times, don't get me wrong, but... Um, I've been fortunate enough with this company called iSports.com.au. They make these custom, you know, goggles, essentially what they are. And they do all kinds of stuff from helmet visors to ski goggles and everything else that makes them uh, custom prescription. So they're based out of Colac. And I remember having to drive two and a half hours out to Colac just to figure out what kind of tint I wanted, you know, different colors, you know, um, the different kind of corrections yeah. and getting checked out by them and everything else. So it's it's been a process. And um, it's 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 going well now. It's, it's it's somewhat back to normal. It's kind of retraining your brain to see a footy come at your head. Yeah, just kind of crazy to think it's you have awesome. to do that at thirty years old. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 been another challenge in my life, and it's another part of the the whole I think experience and um, part of the journey, which is um, very unique within itself. Mate, it's another chapter in that incredible book that will be written soon should, and, yeah, and yeah. stored on this shelf, mind you. Um, yeah, you've got, you, a few, yeah. <laughs> you've got a few. Yeah, got about fifteen books there. Well, yeah, boys, I'm, I yeah. Feel I've like read I'm... literally none of them, but they they, <laughs> they, they, they look good for the studio. Um, no, nah, but in all seriousness, that is um, unbelievable, mate. And again, it's a, a testament to yourself of what you've been able to put through, like sitting in a room for for two weeks. And to go through that in a country where you don't have family or support network, like it, it does sound like hell, really. Like it, it, yeah. it was tough. Times can always be worse, as always. Okay, hundred percent. Hey, what's what's next for Mason Cox? The the podcast, the Mason Cox yeah. show. Is what's next, mate? And that's Mason that's Cox the big show. thing at the moment. Yeah. Um, who knows? I, I, I've I've mentioned it here. I, I would love to create a system for Americans to come over here and play AFL. Yeah, I would love that. That would be an amazing passion of mine. Whether the AFL wants to invest in those kind of things, I'm not sure. They've Stopped investing in multicultural round. They stopped investing in the U.S. combine. So there's a few things I guess they've cut back on given COVID, which I understand totally. But would love to get that up and going. Uh, that would be amazing. Um, I'm big into camping, big into fishing, big mm. into content creation and, and filming and everything. Speaking of camping, I've got a new friend at Darche. Have you met Darche? Darche, Darche no. camping. Camping, yeah, unbelievable oh, swag. Yeah. I've got friends at Zorali. Oh, no, We're no, just no. doing shout-outs. We're, 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 we're all on Darche here. So Darche, Darche, yeah. big fans. <laughs> 
Really good. Yeah. Really good stuff. Um, um, camping. Yeah, what else? Camping, fishing is a massive thing of mine. And um, I've got a bit of a soft spot for the indigenous community here. It's yeah. kind of a, an interesting thing where being not from this country, I find it how amazing the lack of knowledge of the First Nations people here. Yeah. Um, and they do it like I will say this. And Australia is, shows representation. When in America, we don't really show re- representation. It's not only until recently that we've – I guess probably started to um, to change names of you know a football team, the Washington football team from um, from them, and they were from the Redskins, and then also you know the Cleveland Indians. They're looking to change the name too. So I think here the representation of the Aboriginal flag and the Torres Strait um, flag and things like that are not something we see in America, but are very recognizable here. But I still think there's a long way to go. Yeah, um, and it's something I've I've been very passionate about. I've, I've traveled all over Australia. I've been up to recently. I went up to um, uh, during the COVID lockdown actually. Uh, I was fortunate enough for Toyota and BCF got on board and they um, gave us some gear to go all the way up from Gold Coast and drive all the way to Torres Strait. Wow. So through Cape York, through some of the more remote communities. And uh, myself and Jeeva Mentor, who's um, on our netball team, said we want to you know, be able to have this experience and be able to give back to these communities through through sport. And we just did it all on our own. Um, you know, AFL didn't help us, Netball Victoria, Netball Australia didn't help us. And we message all these different people along the way and, and different indigenous groups and different sport, uh, sporting clubs and everything else and made our way all the way up to Thursday Island, met so many amazing people. And um, I think whenever you get to these remote communities, you, you hear these stories and everything else and you just have a totally different aspect and outlook on life. Yeah. Um, and you just want to help these people. Like, and it's not necessarily they need help, but you want to be able to give them the resources possible to, to be able to create the best opportunity going forward mm. in life. And um, I'm part of a different charities. Um, so Shoreline's a charity I'm a part of that does stuff in the indigenous community with, um, you know, up in Cairns, Sydney, um, Darwin, Exmouth. I think they've got people too. And um, they're doing some amazing things of helping out, you know, year 11, year 12 kids to be able to get educated. Uh, and different things they might be interested in. There's if you go to Cairns and you go into their boating, um, if you go on a boat in Cairns, you go out to the reef and stuff. Almost all those people are actually shoreline uh, people that have wow. gone through the system, and it gives them a job post um, high school or within high school to be able to help them get qualified to be different things, whether it be Department of Conservation uh, to be able to get these kind of I guess certificates of, of sorts that you want to say to be able to have a job come straight out of high school. And they do some pretty amazing amazing stuff. And then um, Life Changer is another one, but they're they're a bit more into um, the uh, mental health of, of teenagers going through some tough times, and um, they do some amazing programs throughout Australia, and um, it's a mad shout-out to them. They've got some amazing people on board um, that do some some amazing things in the community, so they're another uh, charity I'm a part of that I do some stuff. How do you find the time? Of, gee, you, you're doing everything. You're everywhere. I have a lot of time, mate. Yeah. I still have a lot of time. I love that. You're yeah. engaged, and it's... Uh, it's, it's giving back. Yeah, it That's is. I'm here. Yeah. I didn't, people have done so much for me over my, my whole life and my career and everything else. I think it's, um, it's if I can do anything in my, you know, in my power to help give back to someone else and change someone's life for the better, then, you know, I feel like I'm doing it right. Mate, you're a star. I uh, appreciate the chat. I appreciate I've fucking really learned a lot today, so I really yeah. appreciate it. It's been incredible to see, see your journey and then hear it firsthand as well um, and make connection and, and finally catch up for a chat. Can't wait to come on the Mason Cox podcast as well. Have a chat there. Um, this is just beginning for both of us, mate. So yeah. congratulations. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Loved it. Thanks for having me, mate. And, um, congratulations on all the success. I'm really looking forward to the future of the show. Yeah.